shared decision making to 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 be very conceptual is um, essentially a, a fancy word to describe a conversation, and it is a conversation between at least two parties. One party is the clinician, traditionally considered the source of expertise about the decision, and the other party is the patient, traditionally considered the subject of the decision, the, the victim of the decision, if I may. This gets redesigned such that now the patient becomes um, an expert in their own life. Um, patients will tell you, I don't like to take pills, I'm not very good at taking pills, or when I take pills, my body doesn't like them. And so I get a lot of side effects. They, they have expertise. Or I talk to my neighbor, and my neighbor has had this. They have knowledge that they have. It could be correct or incorrect, uh, but it's knowledge that they have and they bring in. So instead of ignoring it, it is honoring it. And it's bringing into a conversation where they can share that. The clinicians can share their bit. And then they engage in a, in a, in a second phase after sharing that information where they deliberate. They, they consider the options, and they, they sort of consider the pros and cons of each of the options. Pros and cons are considered in the context of the patient and in relation to what patients value and, and pursue. And from that process, the option set narrows down to perhaps the next best thing we can do together. One of the ways of, of, clarif of de de describing this is how I experienced when I was a, a, a small child and my grandfather was sick. And we were all in the hospital uh, with the adults pacing around a set of closed doors. Some of them were smoking at the time. They were smoking in the hospital, you know, pacing and pacing and waiting. And then the doors will swing, swing open and three or four clinicians will come out with their white coats and basically inform us, we've made a decision. We're going to operate, right? So the process of information sharing with the family about the options, if it existed, was the minimum requirement for essentially informed consent, right? Um, in terms of deliberation, it all happened behind closed doors among the doctors. If you think of a single doctor, it will all happen in the doctor's head with no access, the, the patient will have no access to that process and, and to understand what were the issues that were given greater weight and what were the issues that were given less weight. No input at all. In our study, which now includes, you know, several uh, thousand of instances of shared decision-making use, what we've uh, identified is that on average, shared decision-making interventions extend the consultation by about 10% of, of its duration. So for a consultation in primary care of, say, 20 minutes, it is a two to three minute extension. Anything that enhances transparency and accountability in healthcare can begin to reduce the corruption of healthcare. Shared decision making is one strategy in which we make the options available clear, in which we empower the patients to consider those options and to express their goals. I think clinicians have a moral obligation to actually do everything they can to provide that level of transparency to the decision making process and, and to feel that they are accountable with patients for those outcomes. If you're a young health professional and you want to participate in a patient revolution, you will see this system as it is and you will be an agent of change. Shared decision making is one of the ways in which you, you manifest that, uh, F, that, that spirit or that commitment to a patient revolution.